conducive place to meditate. It's one of the requisites for our practice. A place that's quiet. When people talk, they talk only about things that are necessary, things related to the drama, so they don't, don't disturb one another's concentration. A place far away from the hustle and bustle of the world. We have the time and space to watch your mind. But a place conducive to meditation doesn't always mean that it's comfortable. Sometimes it can be a difficult place, conducive in the sense that it's helping to test the meditation, helping to test your concentration, helping to test your insight. The texts often talk about how important it is when your concentration is still weak that you find a good place to meditate that's very quiet, very conducive, very comfortable. But then when it's not so weak anymore, then you need to test your practice. Because after all, the big tests are going to come someday, aging, illness, and death. They take the gloves off. When they, when they come at you, they don't come nicely. And you've got to be prepared for them, which means that you have to test your practice to make sure that it's up for these things when they come, so that your practice really is a refuge. Many of the Forrester Johns talk about how they never really got a strong sense of refuge until they went into the forest, where things were difficult from all sides. There were diseases, there were dangerous animals. The forest was often a, a hiding place for criminals of various kinds. And they found finding themselves in difficult situations like this, and the question is, what are you going to depend on? There's a passage in the canon where a monk is reflecting. He's out in this big grassy wilderness, and he's sick. What is he going to do? Is he going to go back and try to find a doctor? And he says, no, I'm going to depend on the five strengths. I'm going to depend on the seven factors of awakening. In other words, he's going to learn how to take his practice as his refuge. And that's a principle we should all think about. This is what we really have to depend on. So sometimes, in order to test how much can you really depend on your practice, you've got to place some difficulties in your path. Sit longer than you might like to sit. Stick with a difficult situation longer than you might want to, just to see if you can maintain your concentration and use your insight, use your discernment. To make sure that even though the situation outside is difficult, it doesn't cause suffering inside. This is ultimately what refuge means, your ability to depend on your own mind, to depend on the qualities that you're developing. We talk about taking refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and the Sangha. And ultimately, this is what it means, is taking their qualities and developing them in your mind so that you can depend on them. You can have them at hand wherever you go. And when you, when you feel that things are too difficult, you have to stop and consider. Are they really too difficult? And sometimes they are. Or is it simply a matter that you haven't learned how to depend on your own meditation enough? What can you do to be more dependable? What insight can you gain into the way you're making yourself suffer? This is what the teachings all come down to. When the Buddha said he teaches suffering and the end of suffering, he's focusing mainly on the suffering that we cause unnecessarily. After all, the word suffering, dukkha, or stress has two basic meanings. There's the stress of the three characteristics, which is everywhere in the conditioned realm. And then there's stress in the context of the Four Noble Truths, stress that comes from craving and ignorance. 
when he talks about putting an end to stress, that's the one you put an end to. Because once that's put an end to it, then the mind doesn't suffer. It can live in a world of inconstancy, stress, not self, but it doesn't suffer. It's not stressed. So what you're looking at, what you're supposed to focus on here is the stress that you're causing yourself, that you're causing through your actions, through your ignorance, through your craving. It's when any difficulty comes up, it might be relating to pain in the meditation, ask yourself, what am I doing that's taking this physical pain and turning it into mental pain? When situations outside are difficult, you can ask yourself, what am I doing that's taking that tangle outside and using it to tangle up my own mind? It's your perceptions, your thought constructs. These are the things that create the bridge from outside, inside to inside. So you've got to look at them. This is where your focus has to be very close. It's so easy to focus on the problems outside, but then focusing on the problems outside is one of the reasons why you're suffering. So you learn to do, look at what you're doing. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us focus on the breath and be so sensitive to the breath. You can depend on core rising, and right after ignorance comes fabrication and bodily fabrication, i.e. the breath is right there, first on the list. If you can bring some awareness, some alertness to the process of your breathing, you're helping to cut away at ignorance at a very basic level. And as you get on familiar terms with the breath, become friends with the breath, you find it easier to carry it, this perspective, this focus, into all your activities. So that even as you go through daily life, outside of the monastery, or outside of your regular place of practicing, you've got an inward awareness that you can begin to depend on more and more. Now it's going to take a t it's going to take a while to practice this and develop it. But as with any skill, the more you stick with it, the better it gets. You can't expect that you're going to get really talented at it right away. So you have to learn how to take pleasure in incremental steps. Noticing that there are little things that you used to be able to, that used to knock you over, don't knock you over anymore. It may not seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal. The fact that you're learning a new way of relating to the difficulties in your life. Because over time, these qualities develop, they grow. So that when bigger issues come, you find that you've got the, at least the raw materials. or an inkling of what skills to bring to bear when aging hits, when illness hits, when separation hits, when death hits. You have the qualities you can really depend on. So when things are difficult, look at it as an opportunity to develop the skills that you're really going to need. And to find that sense of refuge inside, there's a chant that the monks are often encouraged to memorize before they go out in the forest. It comes from a sutta in which the Buddha says that back in the time when the devas were fighting the asuras, Saka, who was the king of the devas, would set up his standard and say to his troops, if in the battle you get discouraged, look from my standard. As long as my standard is flying high, okay, we're, we're doing well take heart. And it was through that that he was able to encourage his troops to fight to victory. Now the Buddha said, of course, Saka himself was subject to greed, anger, and delusion, so his standard is not all that reliable. This is for a meditator going to the forest. Take the 
triple gem as your standard. It's a much more reliable standard because the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are not subject to aging. Um, excuse me, not subject to greed, anger, and delusion. And their qualities don't fade in the face of aging, illness, and death. So keep them in mind. To remind yourself, how did they overcome suffering? How did the Buddha, how did the members of the Noble Sangha overcome suffering? Well, it's through developing these qualities that you're working on right now. So whatever the danger, whatever the difficulty, look to these qualities as your way out. Sometimes when things are difficult, we depend on our physical comforts. We learn to depend on other things, aside from the Triple Gem, aside from these qualities. So these qualities really don't get exercised enough. So sometimes, sometimes you have to put yourself in a difficult situation to force yourself to learn to develop these qualities. The more you realize you have to depend on them, the more they tend to grow. I've noticed sort of a John Fuang's lay students in Thailand, the ones who are still really devoted to the practice are the ones who have had major difficulties in their lives, illness, family problems, because they realized that holding on to the practice was a matter of life and death. The ones who didn't have that sense of urgency tend to have drifted off into other things. So try to maintain that sense of urgency in your practice. Be willing to test it. Put yourself in a situation where you have to depend on your concentration, where you have to depend on your discernment to get through. Because it really is a matter of life and death. The life of the mind's goodness, the life of the mind's happiness. of the practice are what will keep it going. No matter what else happens in the world around you.